episode 35. Goodbye, farewell, and amen. So, this is the end, the last episode of series one. I want to start off by saying that I am fantastically grateful to each and every one of you who have listened to this podcast for the last however many episodes. It really means a lot to me that what started out as a project to keep me busy while unemployed is something that other people actually seem to enjoy. And I do hope you've enjoyed this. I know I have. Even when I screw up a recording, or the thousand messed up pronunciations, where I spend too much on niche books, I have enjoyed every minute in front of this microphone. So thank you. Truly, thank you for coming along on this ride with me. When we reached the beginning of the Korean War itself, back in episode 14, I said that I was not a military historian, and I did not want to be. But that's a lot of what I ended up doing. So I apologize for my unintentional dishonesty. This was a big learning experience, and I'm taking the next couple weeks to dig more into how to properly construct histories and how to properly vet histories to make sure I am being more responsible with what I'm saying and with how I construct the overarching narrative of future series. There are many points following the Korean War where we can end our journey. The arc of human conflict is long, and bends ceaselessly towards itself. There are times in history, especially with the benefit of hindsight, where no other decision path seems possible. This, then, leads to the seeming inevitability of conflict. It's easy to say this when you have all the information available about a conflict. But it's difficult to say at the time because rarely does anyone know everything needed to know about the matter. Looking back, we can see that the Korean War was a logical outcome of Cold War ideological tensions and post-World War II territorial division. That the Korean War took the Cold War on the path that it did is interesting, because in this three-year period we find an inflection point where domestic Korean concerns really changed the direction of the wider Cold War. Admittedly, I do think that something would have happened in that vein, even if the North did not invade the South in Korea, mostly because of the high number of anti-colonial movements across the world that could have led to a more bipolar world in the absence of action in Korea. So who's responsible for the Korean War, then? Let's look at three levels of answers. The simple answer is Kim Il-sung and North Korea, because the North invaded the South. The less simple answer is the Soviets and Chinese, because Kim could only sustain an invasion with their support, and he knew he could not start an invasion without that support. The more complex answer is that the Korean War was the result of Japanese imperialism, American anti-communism and post-World War II opportunism, and Soviet anti-Americanism, alongside long-standing Chinese and Russian anti-Japanese sentiments that shaped their response to American actions in Northeast Asia after World War II. All of these are equally as valid, I think. There is also a fourth level, and that is the deep web 3 a.m. after a 10 hours of YouTube recommendations answer, that Gavrilo Princip caused the Korean War when he shot Franz Ferdinand back in 1914. So let's take a step back and see why that is. (laughs) Don't worry, we're not going to do that. It's uh, just a harmless jeep. We've taken this thing back far enough already. What I'm trying to say is that reasonable people can disagree about who is responsible for the division of Korea and, ultimately, the Korean War. It's a question with lots of valid answers. My answer to it is that everyone's responsible. The Americans that proposed it, the Soviets that accepted it, and those Koreans that were able to work within division to reach their goals at the expense of their fellow Koreans. Both Kim Il-sung and Syngman Rhee wanted war against the other, 
so I do think war was going to happen at some point, regardless of international support. But the two Korea's allies played an integral role in endorsing and supporting their chosen side, with strict limitations on how far that support could and would go. That's why Communist China never even attempted to invade Nationalist China during the war, why the Soviets never attempted anything in Europe to distract from what was going on in Korea, and why the United States never used atomic weapons in Korea or Manchuria. There are mitigating circumstances to each of these, of course, but it's generally true that the tail did wag the dog in Korea, but the dog only let it wag so much. Hopefully this series has given you a better understanding of not just the course of the war, but of the many different causes that have ultimately led to one of the more important diplomatic flashpoints in modern international politics. I hope it's given you a better understanding of both the tail and the dog. There are three topics that I should have discussed more in the body of the series, but just did not. So I want to take a minute now and discuss them uh, far too briefly. These three topics are atomic weapons, race issues within the U.S. Army, and women in the Korean War. Atomic weapons represented the most monumental shift in warfare since the implementation of gunpowder. Not only could an aggressor reach out to its enemies and wound them, it could now destroy entire cities and the millions of lives and systems contained therein. By the end of 1950, the United States had a 74 to 1 advantage over the Soviet Union in sheer numbers of atomic weapons. Even more, the reliability of American atomic weapons was mild ahead of their Soviet counterparts, simply because the American ones had been around longer. That does not mean that the Americans did not fear the Soviets' atomic capabilities. The Americans expected the Soviets to take much longer than they actually did to develop an atomic weapon, so when the Soviets did exactly that by 1949, the Americans took quick notice. In some circles of American power, this heightened the desire to use atomic weapons whenever possible. In others, it instilled new fears about the apocalyptic potential of these weapons. By the time the war kicks off in Korea, men like Douglas MacArthur were chomping at the bit to use atomic weapons to show the communists just how serious the United States was about its international interests. Truman also hinted that atomic weapons could be used, but this was never a serious thought in his mind. His morals, and the personal, internal, toll the decisions to use the A-bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki took, sat heavy in Truman's mind during this new opportunity to use the bomb. He feared what may be if he set the bar at a place where atomic weapons were seen not as a weapon of last resort, but as a regular tool for warfighting. That fear, along with the other factors of the political fears of his European allies, a lack of large enough targets in Korea, and the absence of sheer military necessity for using the bomb, ultimately resulted in Truman never really getting close to using the bomb in Korea. If anything, he went the opposite direction and fired MacArthur partially for the general's continued insistence on using the bomb. From the Soviet perspective, not only did Stalin not have a bomb that could be used in Korea, there just wasn't the military necessity to use it. Stalin much preferred letting the Chinese throw hundreds of thousands of soldiers into the Korean Ma as a way of ending the war. Also, he just never really had the opportunity to use the bomb. And Stalin was nothing if not a rabid opportunist in search of the best possible means to his end. It could be said that the Korean War desegregated the United States Armed Forces, but that's not entirely accurate. It did accelerate the process, certainly, but Truman had already ordered the Armed Forces desegregated back in July of 1948. Of course, anti-civil rights forces within the Department of Defense, including the Secretary of the Army, refused to implement Truman's order and were ultimately forced out of the department because of that. 
That anti-civil rights pushback meant that full desegregation had still not occurred by the beginning of the Korean War. The logistical needs of sustaining the war pushed through most desegregation efforts by 1953. But in the earlier months of the war, the dynamic part of the war, all black units were still an unfortunate and deliberate thing. Those black units often were given the worst assignments, such as being tasked with bringing up the rear in a retreat, or given the worst relative defensive positions on the line. Now, I don't want to say much more about this because as a white guy from middle America, I am definitely not an expert on race relations in the U.S. armed forces in the 1950s, but the factor of race, ethnicity, and culture is something that I should have discussed more during the actual series uh, and will make uh, much more of an effort to bring more clearly into future series. In the last topic I should have spoken more about throughout the series is that of women in the Korean War. And that's because I did not really think about it until the end, something I will do from the very beginning of future series. There also is not as much written about the Korean War from a specifically women-centered perspective, or from a feminist perspective that would include women more as an equal part of the conflict which I think they are a part of every conflict, if anything, because every man that marches off to war has a mother, has a wife, has a sister, or has a daughter. And those soldiers leave holes behind in the lives of the women around them. That still centers men in the conversation to a certain extent, so I think I need to be better about focusing on women in their own right and in their own experiences of each historical event. Thankfully, I think history as a field is moving in a feminist direction, with more women joining the academy and more historians examining the past through the eyes of the women involved. In brief, though, uh, women served throughout the Korean War in many different sectors of government and the armed forces. The common image of women in war is often as nurses in the medical service but Korean women served in guerrilla units, in the intelligence services, and at various levels of local and national government as bureaucrats and elected officials. If you are interested in learning more on women in the Korean War, I know I am, I believe Sheila Miyoshi Yager and Ji Yul Kim will soon publish a book on the social and cultural history of the war that should shed new light on this topic. Like the topic of race in the Korean War, I think at some point, once I make the time for it, I might release a special episode or maybe even an interview or two on these topics because they are important and deserve a proper treatment. If you are interested in reading more about the Korean War, the entire list of references for this podcast will remain on the podcast webpage as long as that webpage and this podcast exist. The reference list will probably migrate to a blog post on the site in a couple weeks, but it will remain easily findable. I'll also add a few other things on there you might be interested in reading, like the text of the Armistice Agreement and the official North Korean history of the war. I did not cite that history in the podcast because it is very biased, uh, but it is an interesting read nonetheless. For an overarching history of the entire Korean conflict, from beginning to the early 2000s, I recommend Sheila Miyoshi Yager's Brothers at War. It's big, but it's a fantastic look at a long and complex conflict, and it treats each side of the conflict with the respect that I think it deserves. For shorter books on the war, I recommend I.F. Stone's The Hidden History of the Korean War, Wada Haruki's The Korean War and International History, James Stokesbury's A Short History of the Korean War, William Stuck's Rethinking the Korean War, and Bruce Cummings' The Korean War, A History. Each of them has a different view of the war, and each offers a valuable picture of the war. I personally recommend reading all five of them together, but if you only want to read one, I would specifically suggest Wada Haruki's work. Wada's book is just really well written, and one of the more thoroughly researched books I used in this series. Bruce Cummings is also a good historian on the topic, 
which he has kindly distilled into his 2010 book. His larger books on the causes of the war are really good, but are really in-depth and not so important to read unless you really want to understand the causes of the conflict exceedingly well. His 2010 book on the war is about 240 pages long and is a good read for anyone interested in the war. If you are interested in the thoughts of the American commanders involved in the war, Douglas MacArthur, Matthew Ridgway, Mark Clark, and C. Turner Joy all have memoirs, with Ridgway and Joy specifically writing about their time in Korea. If you want to see what soft propaganda looks like, I recommend Robert Oliver's biography of Syngman Rhee. Oliver wrote the book just after the end of the war, and because he was a close friend of Rhee, his portrait is a fawning look at a flawed man. Andrei Lankov's From Stalin to Kim Il-sung and Martin Bradley's Under the Loving Care of the Fatherly Leader are both good books about North Korea, with Lankov focusing on the Kim government up until 1960 or so, and Bradley taking a longer view of the Hermit Kingdom. And finally, if you are looking for good, small-h histories of the war, those personal accounts that are important for a complete understanding of a conflict, but which uh, I think I made the mistake of leaving out of this podcast for the most part, I recommend Rudy Tomady's No Bugles, No Drums, Alan Millett's Their War for Korea, James Brady's The Coldest War, Martin Russ's The Last Parallel, and Reginald Thompson's Cry Korea. Tometi's and Millet's books are oral histories, and Brady's, Russ's, and Thompson's are memoirs, and all provide valuable insight into what the war was like on the ground that I could have done a better job relaying to you. If you're looking for other podcasts on Korea, I suggest Korea Now and The Korea File. Both cover a broad range of topics, both on modern Korea and Korean history, and are better sources than I from which you can learn about Korean history specifically, and modern Korean culture and politics more broadly. And that's where we'll leave our discussion for good, at least for Korea and the Korean War. Next month, probably. We will discuss, I guess I haven't told you that yet, next series, we will discuss Rwanda, the Rwandan Civil War, and the Rwandan Genocide of 1994. Some listeners might not consider this history, but I wasn't alive at the time, so it's history to me. I also think it will give us important insights into how a small, post-colonial nation can so violently rip itself apart and seemingly, stitch itself back together. We'll discuss things like the meaning of political extremism and how it causes atrocities, and what it takes to achieve justice after atrocities. Please stay subscribed to this feed, and you'll see a trailer with the final release date of the next series about a week before we begin again. If you're on social media, You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as at CTCA Podcast, where I will also be posting the release date of the next series as well. If you are not on social media, you can find more information, including the references for this entire series, at ctcapodcast.libsyn.com. That's ctcapodcast.libsyn.com. I'm already grateful for you listening to this podcast, but I would be even more grateful if you also left a rating and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you use a service like Spotify that does not have ratings, you can always email me your feedback at ctcapodcast at gmail.com or message me through the contact form on the podcast website. As always, I am Trevor Owens, and this was Coming Together, Coming Apart. Series 1, A History of the Korean War. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have an enjoyable spring. (laughs) 